Well, this is a, a fantastic moment. It's an important moment for us, for um, Massimiliano Giornetti, the director of Polimoda, and myself, because we had this crazy idea that today came a reality that means looking at archives from a different angle. And we called it an anarchive because it was a kind of provocation, not really, because we, of course, appreciate all the archives lying in all the museum boxes, and it's very precious. But here we have a moment that we can approach fashion in a different way and more like a research laboratory. Now, this woman is quite unique. And to start uh, the anarchive with Cecil is also very special. Because she sees the world in a different way. She sees archiving in a very different way. And she has this kind of passion that is unique in the world of research. You are unique, Cecil. Are we not all unique? <laughs> so we are going to listen to your story because it's a very um, interesting story and also about how you see archives in the future and why you started those, having those 50,000 molecules in your archive. It's to you. Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. I'm very happy to be here. Do you have some echo here, maybe? Anyway, this is my first public talk, PC. That means past COVID. Mm -hmm. So it feels very weird and at the same time very challenging and interesting because the topic of COVID was the topic in my work. Invisible particle in the air that we all breathe suddenly unable to close down the world. And suddenly we start to talk about the senses differently. Sense deprivation, aerosol, breathing, missing each other, touching each other, losing the senses. So it's the moment to rethink everything, I think, because we all have been in something together. So we can start over again with that common experience. And that applies to fashion as much as it applies to politics and to, to education and so on and so forth. Anyway, I'm taking you know, on a small journey of 25 years of passionate understanding the air that we all breathe. I'm trying to recover the invisible part of reality. I have a feeling there's a lot of echo here. Is that... Is the sound okay? Yeah, it's, okay. Yeah, it's yeah. perfect. Maybe I'm too hyper. Uh, so, nothing is more real than a smell. And we are born with amazing interfaces called the senses. And before there were any information, any semantic or semiotic of words, if you want it like that, on the planet Earth, there were molecules. So the first way of communication on the planet were smell molecule chemistry. And that is happening still. On and off, we tend to understand each other on behalf of how we smell, but mostly we don't take that smell very serious. And the industry also literally trying to cover up that uniqueness of what it means to be. As I said, every nanoparticle on the planet give off smell molecules. Science is now there to let us also understand what this means. And COVID is again a reference for me to, to have uh, in my portfolio to say, listen, yes, this is what I do. I'm literally one of those COVID bacteria, invisible particle in the ear, trying to understand it and what to cope with it and how to to work with this kind of information. So, smell the world, the world of smell. Every breath we inhale contain information in form of a molecule. Air is a shared endeavor. We all contribute to it and we all need it. Every breath you take, you inhale all this information that activate immediately your memory and 
your emotion. A skill that only the animal, the species human, have. And if we don't start to take care of that uniqueness, it also soon will go extinct. So, in other words, we all contribute to the air in this room. When you all leave, your molecules will still sit here. And what, then is, that's when I come in and say, okay, I will take care of the remain and archive it for a reference for the future. So all these invisible particles are information, purpose, communication. And whatever information you provide the brain with, it makes sense of it. Not everything can be looked at, not everything can be said, but everything can be smelled, as long as your sense of smell is capable of doing it. Every breath we do, we inhale all this unique information, and we smell and inhale and breathe up to 24,000 times a day, moving 12,7 cubic meter with air with our breathing. That's massive. And we tend to kind of overlook the importance of smell, also in fashion, very much. We are concentrated on dressing the body, but what is underneath what you're dressing? I think it's as important as the dress itself. So nothing stinks, only thinking makes it so. We are born a general species, the same way as rats and cockroaches. We are very tolerant towards any kind of smell because we need to survive. And we need to understand this in a different way. So this is what I do. I try to understand the world, scaling down so I can scale up again on a different level. So there are multiple approaches to how to understand life beyond the humans. And the only way you can do that is to dare to get out of your comfort zone and maybe also become another animal. So for seven years, I literally went out in the field trying to understand the world I thought I understood from the behalf of how it looks like. But what happened if I understood it also from on behalf of how it smelled like? So here I am in the field showing up is half my job. Understanding the context of concern by being there with my body, with all my senses, taking all the information, the context and the content have to give me, and then process that and then make an action. So here I am in various parts of the world trying to understand what's going on on beyond, on beyond, on beyond how things smells, uh, look like. And in 2002, I was discovered by the industry, an industry whose prime purpose has been to cover up the world with perfume, deodorant, detergent, etc., etc. And these are devices that are used in the industry to replicate nature, to make synthetic version of nature. So I said, oh, maybe this device can be my extended nose. And here we go. Off I went with this little device in my pocket. So it became the, the, my iPhone for those, time. those 25 years of research. I used this device to collect molecules emitting from massive amount of smell sources. And these are the labs that then did all the analysis of my recordings. So these are some of my recordings corresponding to my database, which is 15,000 molecules. So this is my pixel, so to say. This molecule is invisible reality. And this is my laboratory with what I then replicate and reproduce and try to understand the invisible air that we all breathe in my laboratory in Berlin. So reality consists of micro macro level. And I'm taking on a, you on a small journey just to show <coughs> the various contexts. Learning from other animals, what I said before. <coughs> um, as we all know, the trees are smelling, the flowers are smelling, but these molecules are not necessarily there for us to, to be, enjoy. They are there as a tool of communication between plants and insects. So what does that mean? So I was then commissioned by south of Germany to literally map where, what vegetation where, and how and who of other animals were actually using which kind of plant for what kind of purposes and what kind of com communication. 
So if a tree sends out a molecule, a bee come and help the tree to pollinate and, and reproduce. But a tree can also send, send out a molecule that says, please don't come, I'm full. So how do we understand this? So I put 20 students into the field trying to understand what this means. Here we are in the field putting molecules, replicating molecules, and trying to understand the life of a bee or a fly or an ant. So this person is following the molecules produced by this ant. That's, you see, this molecule is there to tell the surrounding, please stay away, I'm dangerous. As similar to this one. Do you see any of the slides? So this is the skill of what the senses can do. This is the bodies, uh, the senses, the interfaces used for the purpose they were there to, to be for. Here we are going into a little uh, other uh, project, understanding nature. What is our surrounding consisting of? What is nature? We see a tree, but what is a tree? So I collected the molecules, made an archive of the journey of a tree from the forest till it became my table. So all that journey has tons of molecules. So I can replicate and reproduce and revive this tree for endless purposes. So these are the ways of using the knowledge of smell for multiple purposes of understanding the surrounding and also understanding uh, you know, the purpose of a smell in a various context. This is a much more complex project which is dealing with biotechnology, we were able to replicate, reproduce the smell of extinct plants from Hawaii. So at Harvard Herbarium, they had this plant that gone extinct in 1907. We were able to take segments from the plant, grew the DNA, and this DNA started to grow at tissues. The tissues started to smell. I scanned the world to find the molecules and replicated the plan that don't exist anymore. Extinction is part of evolution, as we all know, but it's also a bit about, the project is also about humans' emotions, humans' uh, senses at part of, potentially also could be part of uh, extinction. So this is the Natural History Museum in Bern. You walk into the museum and you suddenly put yourself on display in a diorama. So you uh, show yourself skill to show emotion towards extinction and nature. And if you come from the other side, you know, you see it like this. So kind of playing with the, the human position and human perception is this. This is a Venice Biennale of Architecture two years ago, where the project was at the Italian pavilion. You enter and you put yourself on display in the diorama, smelly extinction of plants that are not there anymore. I'm working on Pompeii. What does the past smell like? When you are in the field, how do, you, how do you operate? How do you understand the past? So this is Pompeii. So it's a commission by UNESCO and, and the Pompeii Foundation and the Italian government. And they want to understand what is going on, you know, what small smell molecules could emit from the soil, from the dust, from the past. And how could that type of information potentially alter the protocol that's been written so far about Pompeii? Pompeii somehow had become the distant land of archaeology. So this is an attempt to challenge that knowledge. And very often, I put myself in that kind of position to challenge knowledge, because it's not one way, but there are many ways of understanding the reality. So in the field, with the archaeologists, I am there to trigger them to not only look for glass and iron and stones, but also breathe and smell. And I take care of that ear that they are breathing and smelling and showing them the data and telling them the molecule that I find and what type of information those molecules potentially have. So with the geologists, we were able to go down to the strata of 79 AD. I collected the molecule at that very moment, all the archaeologists were crying. They said, wow, 
That's historical. So taking a knowledge out of its comfort zone, putting it into another knowledge, and challenging the other to rediscover, rethink oneself in that very moment is very much what my work is about. And that's why I also say, but there's not a beginning and an end. It's like life is endless, as long as you are part of it. So here's Pompeii, and we are now building up an archive, looking into how can invisible information be part of, in this case, education about the ruins, and also the storytelling about the various ruins. And an experiment I did was, I placed some of the smell back to where I found them, and suddenly, all the guides were altering the story they've been telling for 20 years. And those storytelling, those stories that those 12 different language guides, excellent as they are, they always change depending on what they had for dinner last night, who they didn't see yesterday, their private life, the psychological state of mind, so you never really have the same story. But the smell is truth. So when the smell were on the sides where they were walking and telling the story, suddenly they all told the same story. And this is very interesting to see how one can actually also add and use that type of information, that context, bringing that knowledge back to the site of concern and the context of concern. So this is Pompeii, and this is how I then use the, uh, the knowledge and use the information with the Bangalore High Tech Park in India, I were able to develop a technology that enabled me to go under the skin of the stone, like go under the skin of the body, to highlight, to amplify, that's what I do with the tree. This is what I can do with the stone. So bringing the stone of Pompeii back to the museum and let the stone re be alive again. The stone knowledge suddenly start to come to talk to you. And something happened here, you know, people started to engage with the, with the site and with themselves in the context of the site differently. And as I always say, without emotional reaction, there is no action. We cannot look at the pictures anymore. We cannot look at the news anymore. We are over the top of information with visual stimuli concern. And we have to start to understand the importance of all the senses, not just one or two. So engaging with, with history, engaging with the past here, using the senses, I call this object emotional artifact. Normally artifacts are object behind glass, and very much in context of archive, also in fashion, you have the most valuable or or expensive items just sitting behind glass, and we never ever get to smell them. I'm working on a big project, North Metropolitan Museum in New York, where we're trying to bring back some of the molecules from the past and the objects that are sitting behind glass in a different way, in a similar way that I do with the stone in Pompeii. So here we are uh, to the project that's also partly on display upstairs. In 2004, I was invited by Harvard University, together with MIT, to look into what's going on in the body. Can we actually smell that the body has a different psychological state of mind? I said yes. My nose is able to smell when you are happy. My nose is able to smell when you are sad and when you're excited. And that's what the noses are there for, to understand what's going on in the, in the various contexts of where we live and what we do. So I developed a project, an experiment. I looked into the notion of fear and paranoia in the US during the Bush government. Could I be able to, and this was during the, a lot of issues around terrorism and, 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 the, and, and the like. I was curious, can I smell that a person is afraid? And I had a small device added to the body of 22 men that were part of the experiment, collecting the molecules from the body without any additional smell on the body, which is essential. As I always say, we are born with a unique smell as unique as our fingerprint. Unfortunately, we smell the deodorant before we smell the, the, the breast milk. So, you know, I think sometime also in fashion, let's find out what the smell body beyond the way it looks. Starting with the smell of it, sometimes it can be very interesting. 
And it's again all about tolerance, it's all about education. We can educate oneself to be tolerant beyond one's acceptation. So this project then uh, became a very interesting research uh, starting point for me. And the molecules that I collected from these men, I replicated, reproduced, and turned into a nanotechnology that was demonstrated upstairs in the Arn Archive um, exhibition, where the uh, replicated body smells are becoming invisible portraits of, of people on the wall. And the only way you can activate these smells is by touching the skin of the person, the invisible person, the wall become the skin of the person. So here is similar projects on display in various parts of the world. This is a Singapore, uh, this is reality outside and this is reality inside. So decontextualization of body and then put the core element of the body, in this case the smell, and you touch and you activate and the fear is gone. It's a very interesting project and it's create attention, it creates a, a, a yeah, reaction all over in various ways. In MIT, I had a woman that came by, guy number nine, every morning on the way to work and kissed the wall. And it became this very touchable moment. The person was not there and I started to have a conversation with this lady and she was, it was unforgettable what she kind of um, yeah, let, told me. So here is me in PT, how many years ago? Mm -hmm. 2000 something, uh, taking that project out of its comfort zone of science and art and sitting in PT Fragranza speaking about body smell as uniqueness. Replication of body smells as unique as a fingerprint. And it became a very interesting topic that year. It's like, oh, do we need perfume? Or should we maybe turn that into perfume? Or so on and so forth. And for that time, it was very radical. And it's still a radical thing, <laughs> you know? I mean, I wear my own smell. So think about that, you know? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? How do you wear your own fashion? Do you wear your own fashion? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. And this is a portrait of a guy. And this is uh, the smell of another one. Someone lost someone and wanted to be remembered, reminded of that person in a different way. So I made a soap of that person's smell. And whenever you wanted to be reminded of that person, you washed yourself with the smell of the person. And the smell is so strong, it take over the entire space. At pretty beautiful uh, uh, ritual that they, this became, yeah? And this is a solid selfie, 10 kilo of my own smell. Just as a small kind of challenge on, 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 on all the selfie we are doing out there, you know, that we don't even know when we took them last and which year and why and so on and so forth. So the body beyond the body. Here, you all know David Beckham. David Beckham is famous for having played football. And he was the main, mainly sponsored by Adidas. I've been working with Adidas for nearly 20 years. Behind the sea, in the kitchen, in the lab. Literally cooking up uh, garments that have been used, trying to find out how much sweat remain after 5 years or 10 years or 20 years. How can you add molecules to, to fabric to make Atlas perform better? nanotechnology, embedded molecules, it's amazing research going on. So having all this uh, access to all this used garment, I then came up with this idea, what if I go inside the shoes of David Beckham? You know, I like under the skin of things. So here I am analyzing the bacteria in David Beckham sneakers. And I found this amazing bacteria that, again, is literally the DNA of David Beckham's smell. And I also found this in this cheese. So I said, oh, and we all know very often when we speak about body and, and using language to describe uh, the body, we use cheesy, cheesy feet, or cheesy this and cheesy that, you know? And it's not without the reason that this is the case. So here is the cheese molecule. So on behalf of this, <coughs> we started to, to, to ferment a cheese, and this is 
Adidas Dassler sneaker cheese for the London uh, football, um, the World Cup of football in 2008. And it's edible. You can actually also, we got it certified and you can actually eat the cheese. I have some in the, in the back, <laughs> if somebody wants to try. So this was then taken to the next level. Uh, you know, this, the, all the project is radical, but the science behind it is really serious. So how do you bring serious issues, you know, to, to the world in a new way? And I tend to think that joy and playfulness is essential to understanding. We all learn in the context of joy and play from zero to puberty using all the senses. And what I try to do in my work is to bring back this joy and playfulness from early stage of life. Like we tend to forget to enjoy what it means to be. And the senses, the senses especially the sense of smell, contribute to this very, very much. So, um, yeah, so here, and also the nano level of what the body is. If you wash away everything, you are not happy. And the micro level of life on your body is less happy than you are. So how do we start to kind of understand the necessity of having microbes on the skin and also appreciate their uh, existence? So we did a huge project at Harvard Medical School where we started to map the body, what bacteria and what smells are where on the body. And we found the same kind of smell and molecules on cheeses. So we took then this project to the next level. At, this was also at Stanford University in the US at Harvard collaboration. And we made our own cheeses first and then we sent a pitch to uh, celebrities. This was when everybody was making celebrity perfumes. So we said, okay, can we make celebrity cheeses? The pitch was, if you, in the future, would have to contribute to food production, and we will need your skin bacteria to produce cheese, what type of cheese would you like to be, and where on the body would you like to bacteria to come from? So. These are celebrity cheeses, but real stuff. So this is Olafur Eliasson, gave us his tears. Mark Zuckerberg, armpit. Hans Ulrich Obrist, forehead. Bill Gates, feet. And many, many more. All these cheeses smell exactly like the people. So if you, in the future, in the education of fashion, want to make a portrait of a person, you just go to Dublin, to the Trinity University, you open one of these fridges, you smell, and then you, here we go. So how can we get inspired beyond the comfort zone and try to think differently in, in the field we want to be in? I think it's very important. Now, again, back to the body and what the body produces and how the body operates. This is Tate Modern Turban Hall. I develop a smell molecule. The only purpose of the molecule is to make you cry. So we all want to cry sometimes. Sometimes it's impossible to cry. So you enter the turban hall and you started to cry. It became this bucket opener. People are still writing me, and this is 2019, writing me, oh, thank you for opening my bucket. And I, sell, I send this molecule to many people. Just to, you know, and it's a physical reaction and that then cause an emotional reaction. So, a trigger. And here we go, to a next step, what the body is able to do. We know what comes in has to come out. We all know that very well, you know, that's applied to ear, that applied to food. And we all know, you know, so the crying, like how can you make a situation where people actually cry without forcing it too much, yeah? And in this case, it's about laughing. I wanted to make a situation where people laugh naturally. And we all know that farting is funny. Also meaning real smells are actually very funny. So together with a chef in Innsbruck, a luxury restaurant and Innsbruck Museum of Contemporary Art, I developed a drink 
which only purpose is to produce gas in your stomach. And I placed my smell in that drink. So I used the body as an organ for my smell. You know what's coming. <laughs> so here you walk through the museum, and we did the mat together with the chef. We did the mat. How many meters you need to go before you f the, f the first, you, first time you let, have to let the air go? Yeah. So you walk into one room, and they're like, oh, oh. So you don't believe it. And this project is very interesting because you don't believe what will happen. So you told in the beginning, you drink this drink, and you will fart. F art. Fart. Yeah? <laughs> and you don't believe that it will happen, and the body is walking, and you have very well dressed, and suddenly, oh my God, what's going on? <laughs> Where should I let it? Should I let it or not? <laughs> so you come into Carson Huller room, it's like, oh no, that's too embarrassing. And then you hear somebody else letting, and then you let, and then you let, and it's <laughs> hilarious. But if you want the collective fart, you just wait, and this is the piping system of the museum. So I let all the air come out of all those spaces, and all blown into a bench, like an outdoor sitting area, old time toilet. And you can sit down, contribute to the collective fart that then blown out in the city of Innsbruck. And then the newspapers, like the, the fart became the taxpayers, you know, the, the taxpayers' money get up and fart. And this is kind of very conservative ski resort. It was amazing. And people had the best time ever. And this is Austria. You know, naturally, you know, we all do it. And we all laugh when somebody else do it. So why not just enjoy it doing it? There's no taboo. Come on. Anyway, so body is unique. And the way the body operates sometimes is beyond one's uh, expectation. And again, another uh, air source, speaking. How do we uh, speak? Speak is also air. Without air, you cannot so talk. Yeah? So I've been building up a huge archive around how to talk about smell. And we all know, most languages, there is no language. Also very much because uh, smell is so quick. It bypasses the rational part of the brain and enter hippocampus, activate emotion and memory to synapses. So there's no time to find the word. But there are ways of understanding how it potentially could be done. The way we talk about color is also a code. A color is a code. The green, the blue, the red is a code. It doesn't mean anything. So why could not or can we not make a similar system towards smell? And what would that mean? So I've done a lot of field work, showing up is half my job, being in the field, doing it myself first is essential to the outcome. So here we are out in the field, collecting uh, language, having smells and people's reacting, reaction to the smells and trying to build up a unique language beyond the conventional smell good, smell bad, and a metaphor, uh, it smells like this, it smells like that. It's boring, it doesn't mean anything. So, these are various projects where the city and the smell of, the, of concern are actually talking through abstract coded language. And the next level of this is done with the University of Pennsylvania and the, uh, the, and the Princeton University looking into emotional intelligence. And since smell is so connected to emotion, how do we talk to emotion? And we've done, I've done a lot of research on this. So the moment you talk, the way you say what you say, the sound of the voice, the moment you say it, is called paralinguistic. That is the emotion. Yeah? And because smell is so much about emotion, I develop a software that collects only the emotion in your voice the moment you say something towards the smell. And it is amazing. Then the AI is sorting out this various abstract expression towards various smells and building a huge database. So whenever I have an exhibition, this work is on display, and the building or the context of concern, these sounds are amplified throughout the building. So you have literally 
the sound or the language for emotional intelligence, I call it. It's like coded, yeah? So, again, back to coding. Uh, how can we talk and send message beyond the way we normally do? You all know gas, natural gas, don't smell. Once upon a time, there was a huge problem with all the gas explosions that happened. Someone had to do something. One placed an abstract smell on the top of gas to make it perceivable. This is a smell code. Why don't you code your collection? Why don't you code your garments? So that instead of having your, your label in the back, you have a molecule embedded in the garment. You know, these are different ways of talking, a different way of communicating content. So that smell of gas had to be learned all over the world. The smell of gas, when you smell it, you know the gas is leaking. And since last year, those molecules are, the patent is over. You can literally take those molecules and do whatever you want with it. Do you want to make a perfume smelling like gas? I don't think so. So these are new ways of coding, new ways of learning languages. I did a project for the German History Museum of the World War I. There were no references, no smell sources. I relied on history book and constructed an abstract smell and gave it a reference. So this is the beginning of that kind of coding system. In 1997, while studying in Lund University, which is the Oxford of Scandinavia, I had 365 abstract molecules. What I mean here is non-referential smell. It's as if you smell something for the first, <clears throat> first time. It's the A without the B in the alphabet. And this is how I work. Only with abstract smell, I can, con can create something concrete. All those abstract smells were connected to news content codes. Here you have the situation. The Reuters send the news, the news would condense down to the content code of text, the text activated an abstract molecule, and we were testing how much do you remember of the news and how long. Stunning. And this is, these are your scientific kind of research that then can be applied, and I apply it all the time in my work. Yeah? I give my talks an abstract smell so that people never forget the talk and never forget me. And if I wear a smell, it's also for those kind of purposes. I never in my life wear a perfume. I wear a molecule to tell, yes, come to me, I'm cool, or stay away, I don't want to talk about the weather again. So all this, you know, how do you make fashion, how do you make garments to give, send that kind of message? Stay away from me, please, fashion. Yeah? Or, come, I'm, I have interest in animals, or I have interest in rain, or, you know, name it, I say it. There are so many other ways of, of doing what we do than what we normally do. So, these are small devices that can be used to carry these molecules around. If I want to be remembered, I'm reminded of something, I just break an ampulla that say, oh, that moment on Mount Everest, that's what it was. And the recall of that moment is there within nanoseconds. And these are more luxury devices. So this ring is for self-defense. You open the ring and there are three type of molecules that you put into the ring, come to me, listen to me, stay away. And it's amazing. You stay ar around with this ring, you open it carefully, together with your blue dress or red dress or no dress at all, and the ring do the talking. And observing action and reaction is already a project. So daring to take one's knowledge out of one's comfort zone is essential to progression. And here, a more a radical version of this. I made a small bracelet for women in India that have problem being violent, attacked, sexual attacked. So in this little bracelet, there is a molecule that if the girl had problem, you just rip off and the entire neighborhood is smelling. At least the girls or women gain time 
and can run. And the molecule is so contaminating that whoever comes close, you can detect <coughs> months later. So these are small experiments that we are doing with some of this knowledge and the research done in the labs. Anyway, back to education here. We are playing with climate change. We are learning serious issues in the world, playing with molecules. What is chemistry? What is an alphabet? What is a molecule? What does it mean to have a sense? You don't need very high-end devices to do all these things. The hardware and the software on the body is unique enough. And also how to learn content in the context of a smell molecule, like this I mentioned before. Learning mathematics in the context of an abstract molecule and to recall it when you have the test. That's how the scholars of the past, before computer, learned knowledge. The monks, the, the academia, without any kind of writing system, that's how they learn to memorize. There's a wonderful book called The Art of Memory, I absolutely recommend. So this is design schools, what does it mean to have senses, what does it mean to touch material, what does it mean to describe what you do with other words than the conventional. And this is a smell and tolerance, which is the, you know, you can be tolerant of people's skin color and religion, but if the smell of the person is not acceptable, then you have mostly have problems. So these are small workshops all over the world, smell and autism, smell and disability, <coughs> and again, back to fashion. Oh, you know. <laughs> Balenciaga is uh, one of uh, the few companies that I said yes to because they listened to me before I listened to them. And uh, this is my first uh, collaboration with Balenciaga. I did the smell as a template to the story that them I wanted to tell with the European Parliament. And it was five different smells that complemented the set design and the collection carefully. And what is interesting in this collaboration that happened, started to happen in 2018, is that suddenly smell component is part of the storyboard that Demna and Balenciaga is doing continuously. That means, uh, having said that, no smell is also a statement about smell. <coughs> So these are some of the other uh, display. This is the, the show with all the disasters. And this is the winter landscape. And this is during COVID. Uh, we did a VR set where I had collected the smell molecule from Christopher Balenciaga's basement in Basklan. And I embedded that smell into a letter written by Christopher Balenciaga. So you open this high-tech VR set and a smell from somebody's basement and that was amazing so most people who had that vr set put the vr set in the basement because the smell was so strong <laughs> <laughs> and then they came back uh, you know to it and said wow yeah but it's still smelly and then i did the wall street the uh, new york uh, which is a huge archive i have done about exchange about money about value what does it mean from bitcoin till the corona and backwards, um, in the Wall Street uh, fashion show, I produced dollars where I embedded the smell of money into the dollar. And in the show, the smell was uh, present in the, in the, in the Wall Street uh, venue. And here is the soil, uh, the, 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 the last big show of that kind, which was um, Santiago Serra's installation in Paris, but because soil is an active organic matter, it's difficult to convince to bring the soil into a building. So they had to sterilize the soil. Yeah. And uh, that's, uh, you know, in the end, it can be anything. So this is the origin of it, and it's beautiful. So I did, I've done research on soil for 20 years. It's one of the most interesting molecules I've ever come across. When you smell soil after rain, you, you, you all get, wow, that's something. That molecule is produced by a bacteria in the soil for the purpose to attract springtail. 
And that molecule is proven to work as an antidepressant to produce serotonin in the brain. I sprayed the entire space for this dystopian landscape with that molecule from the soil, replicated soil molecule, it's beyond. And you enter and you felt very depressed when you saw the landscape, maybe. But when you left, you were like, wow, what happened? Anna Vintour had this molecule sitting in her bag, and so many others had it sitting on the garment <laughs> because it's very contagious. And also that's a purpose, a little bit from my side, sorry. And she literally came back to me some years later and said, Cecil, when I feel bad, I just open my handbag and I'm good again. <laughs> so, what is fashion? What is garment? What is accessoire? How can we refunction, repurpose these things? So, here we are. Balenciaga just started to do haute couture. Legacy, Cristobal Balenciaga. He was active, 37 to 67. Have an amazing archive. He was an interesting personality. I got access to all the remains from his life. Being in the elevator, being the, 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 the um, you know, gar uh, uh, basement in his house, his house in Basclam, you know, in the archive, we found so many things. And I've been collecting molecules, building up this massive archive of the legacy of Christopher Balenciaga's life. And here he was a smoker, he, my mother was a sewer, had a machine, used the oil of the machine. I mean, fantastic. So here in the archive, collecting molecules from garments that Balenciaga uh, did himself. And this is uh, recordings, and this is then the molecular database and archive from Christopher Balenciaga's life. And these molecules are then used in various combinations for various purposes. So every year when Balenciaga has a hot couture show, this smell is the only component in the showroom. So you enter and you smell the smell from before the place was renovated, plus additional molecules from the archive, plus them as additional information that he then provided me with, me with uh, later. So here you have a various uh, setting from the fashion shows, and then we turn some of the molecules into, uh, and all the shops, Balenciaga shops in the world have a combination of the molecules from the, art, from the database. And here you have a candle we made for the haute couture. So this candle also is a combination, few of the molecules from the database. So the database that you saw here, this one, is so to say the starting point for everything that has to do with smell in relation to the haute couture of Balenciaga. And, uh, yes, so here we are. Uh, here I'm walking my smell for Balenciaga. <laughs> that was the last show. Together with Linda, yeah. we walked the show. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Cecil, yes. you asked me to come here to <laughs> ask questions after your talk. I don't have much to say, she says, maybe half an hour and I'm finished. So I don't know what to ask anymore because it was wonderful, really. Yeah. <laughs> but anybody, anybody else have some questions? Maybe that's even conversation. Ask question. Yes, please. No. So, in principle, everything I do is extinct in the next nanosecond. So, smell because it's alter, it takes uh, take over. And, you know, the molecules I work with, chemicals, of course, I can dilute them and keep them forever. Yeah? But the recorded molecules or any smell, mole you, you know, real smell disappear and alter very quick because of the external molecular influence. So, every recording I do is in the next nanosecond extinct. 
So it's just a nano second of smell is what I'm recording. Yeah? So the way I work is like I do many of those nanoseconds to look into similarities and to look into to, um, molecules that, has, that are um, um, st st more static, more, you know, not, you know, more temporary, yeah, uh, uh, more yeah, stable and others that are temporary. So I can see that after 25 years of, of doing this, I can see what is from the surrounding and I can see what's from, yeah. We're now working on this huge project in, at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. We have the late, the earliest ga uh, garment I have was 1912, worn by one person and then given to the Met. You won't believe what I'm able to smell. No. Yes. It's revolutionary. Yeah. So it's like asking questions in the future of archives in the end. What are we doing with all the stuff, you know? The sitting there, it costs money to maintain it, you know, and half of it can never really be shown in its real form to the world, you know? So maybe a smell of it is the, end, the result, you know? It's low cost to maintain it, the data is there, you replicate it endlessly, you know, and it changes everything, yeah? And a lot of the objects, a lot of the items, you know, it's also toxic material that used. For example, we have some objects from Schiaparelli that are falling apart that you never will ever see ever again. So what do you do with this? You know, how do you show that object or that artifact to the audience in a different way? So that's what I'm doing for the next Met Gala exhibition. And it's called Sleeping Beauty, Reawakening Fashion at the Metropolitan Museum. Opening 6th of May, so please come to New York. And smell, <laughs> fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. No, nothing. You know, and it's very important to say nothing. I'm nothing against perfume. I'm nothing against fashion. I mean, it's not about being against. It's about, you know, seeing other ways of of understanding. Yeah? The perfect fit for the yeah. an archive start. Yeah. A question. Um, your work is profound, <coughs> and the power it has to help people. Um, you had the wall where people would kiss and they would cry. Have you looked at um, the things you do to help with me mental illness and anxiety, which is very prevalent in society today? Is that a part of your research? Yes, the molecule I was talking about, for yeah. example, the, the earth molecule. Yes, yes. But what I showed today is just a fraction. very little of my work. Yeah? yeah, I could go all kind of direction. Because there are smells everywhere, so I am everywhere, you know? What is solid in what I do is my knowledge, and not where I place myself. I can be in fashion, I can be education, I can be hardcore science, you know, art, and so on and so forth. And it doesn't matter, you know? I think what matters is that you love what you do, and you're committed, and you have passion towards. My success is my passion. You know, my, my success and passion for life and what life is, the moment changed, the moment they understood what the interface the senses can do. I was looking at the world. I'm from Norway. I look at the world, I look at nature, I was like, so boring, yeah? And then I blindfolded myself and did the same route five times, and like, what? You know, how do I find what anymore, you know? So daring to get out of your comfort zone, you know, how would you find your way if you don't see the way, yeah? How do you, you know, how do you appreciate fashion if you don't see what people are dressing? You know, if you kind of, the, you know, one of the senses is not working, they operate properly. You know, it's important as an exercise sometimes, you know, to be uncomfortable. It's like when the moment you got a scar on your, on your skin, you never forget how you got it. You know? So, daring to get, to take risk, daring to jump into deep water and not necessarily know properly how to swim. That's when you move on. That's innovation. That's where you're like, find solution. Yes. Be different. Yeah? Daring to be different. Daring to dress different. Daring to say things, what you think. And, and yeah, have, a, have an open mind. And also having you know, this in mind, what we try to have upstairs, you know, with all of us trying to rethink fashion in terms of archives. You know, it's, 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 it's insane, you know, what sitting out there. You know, I, the Custom Institute have 35,000 items. That's how many years to show that. So once you 
captured a molecule, you can recreate it? Like that moment that before it vaporizes or disappears? No, what I, what I, I create the data. So the device enables me to collect the molecules. Those recordings correspond to my database, which are chemicals. So it's chemistry. It's a synthetic re reproduction or replica. I'm reproducing realities. Yeah? And this is like database of the database. So if I do climate change, which I do a lot, you know, pollution and so on, I compare data. Yeah? And then the build up databases. And then I connect to other chemistry labs in the world. So my database grows. Grow. Yeah? So the molecules I have, maybe the, the Stanford lab don't have. And then together we have 40,000. So this is how you build up different systems. You know? It's an open source. Like it's share. It's, you, we are working towards that. Yes. You need the chemistry. I'm a, I'm a chemist. So you need the chemistry to be able to do to do it, yeah? Mm -hmm. You can record endlessly, but you also need the skill how to choose what for what purpose, yeah? Amazing. Are there other, other questions? Are you all doing fashion or does somebody else do something else? <laughs> the business of fashion, the communication of fashion, fashion history. Journalism of fashion. Journalism. <laughs> <laughs> how about, can you hear me well? <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here and for your inspiring talk. Um, I read this article where you said that one of your dreams was actually to have molecules from space and that you were talking to NASA about it. And I thought this was actually really interesting. I wanted to ask if there's any news regarding that and if you have any other future dream I projects. I no, I didn't understand. You spoke a bit fast. Can you repeat it? You Sorry. read an article about <laughs> Um, I saw this article where you said that one of your dreams was to have molecules from space. And from that you space? Were, yeah. And that you were talking to NASA, which I found really interesting. I yes. So are there any news? And do you have other, other like, dream future For projects? For example, uh, what I didn't, I didn't tell uh, mm -hmm. all my story here. My story is pretty, pretty complex and, and diverse. Uh, some of the projects that came out of the cheese was collaboration with NASA. So we used, uh, we made an application with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the various universities, the substance. And that substance, you just have to grab on your skin and get the bacteria put into the substance and you ferment it, whatever product you wanted to eat. Call it sake, call it beer, call it whatever. Um, yes, I am still in talk with NASA. I would love to collect something. But I think it's already collected. It's just uh, not public yet. Elon Musk, I'm sure, have some. <laughs> Maybe one day he will knock on my door <laughs> to understand what he has hiding in his closet. <laughs> this is all about curating. You had that um, in the Foster Museum, uh, that project also with the air conditioning system and yes. so on. It was kind of interesting. I'm an air conditioned hacker. I hack air conditions. So I, I, I did a, a massive solo show in uh, Oslo, uh, Norway, my home country. I was invited in the middle of COVID. And the moment, the day I got invited, Norway closed the borders. And the building of concern was Renzo Piano's beautiful building on, this, on the harbor of Oslo. And Renzo Piano is a, a master of air. He understands air, you know, Santo Pompidou is a piping, and you know, his, his, his topic is air. And also, you know, if there's nothing in the building, there's still air. Back to my, my, my starting point, you know, the air is a shared endeavor. We all contributed, we smell this molecule provided by Cesar, it's still in the air, you never, you know, you never know where. But air is, is a motion in motion. So, I decided not to stay in a hotel for three weeks in quarantine, but to stay in Renzo Piano's building in Oslo. So they locked me in, that, in, the, in the museum. They, they literally was like a luxury, uh, luxury prison. So every day for lunch, there was a box in front of the door. But never the, <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable. So I then suddenly started to understand the building as biology. The air. I was like crawling around. I was like breathing up and down, and temperature and moving, and starting to kind of become one with the building. And uh, I got access to the air condition. Started to manipulate the air condition, 
revealing the air piping, uh, reached out to the stakeholder. All the Norwegians were so bored to that, sitting at home and looking TV. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, she's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, we are so bored. We, you know, at least we get some excitement though. So the owner of the building said, yeah, yeah, take down the walls. Yeah, make holes. Yeah, reveal. Anyway, so I did it. And I took the facade of the building, put it inside and vice versa. I revealed the air piping in the main room. I literally rewrote the protocol of the museum. It normally should have been 40 pipes, but it was only two. So again, under the skin of the building, you reveal what is, and also under the skin of the body, you reveal what is. So anyway, it became this incredible uh, kind of research project, you know, that then became kind of rethinking the building anew. Yeah? So using COVID moment to re-figure out what this museum should do and why should it do what. And also making the air condition and the condition of the air is part of the agenda for how you invite somebody to do something in the space. Yeah? It's like, hey, here's a museum, here's carte blanche, here's the money. But what is the museum? What is the shop? What is the body? Or what is what to, you are literally delivering something for, you know? So, again, showing up, trying to find out before you deliver, or maybe not deliver at all, because you found out too much, yeah? So I think these are uh, at least the, the way I approach it. And what I did then, I got forensic scientists to come with me into the museum to explore all the scars in the building, to all this, Norway with this wealth, the shiny and the, you know, shiny and the money, you know, everything is shiny, everything is new, everything is new money, you know, oil, turn Norway upside down. So I wanted to kind of reveal all the scars, I said, listen, underneath the surface, you're not part of your opinion, you're sitting there, you're pretending you are nice and, and, and human and so on and so forth. Listen, that's not the case. So using the museum as a metaphor to tell my story, the reason why I left and the reason why I decided to come back now during COVID, because now was the moment for them to understand what I'm doing. So that is the complexity of, of kind of delivering, you know, not just uh, geographically, but also content-wise. So it became this incredible uh, situation. I ran the piano and the, I called the exhibition RE. I even have it here, but I didn't show any of it. RE as a reality. I live in Regensburger Strasse in Berlin. I record all my life, reality and real stuff. I remember very well. So all this RE, rethink, reality, re, you know. And then I had Renzo Piano, uh, Rem Kola's graphic designer, did a score for me, uh, which then became the exhibition, navigation through the exhibition. So you had a periodic table on the musical score. And you entered the museum, there was no text, there was no not my name, there was no interpretation, no nothing, yeah? So people came and they're like, oh, what do we do now? Yeah, it's like if you have a fashion show and there are no chairs, and you're like, oh, what's going on? Or the light is, is, is dark and so on and so forth. We had no light, we had only daylight, and Norway in the winter is from 10 to 3, it's daylight, and then it's dark, and then what? But that's, again, COVID, people just got out of COVID, the 6th of October, 21, the day before my opening. As if the Norwegian government knew that I was coming. They closed the border the day I got my invitation, <laughs> and they opened the border the day before my opening. So it was all this, you know, wishful thinking. You are, ah, you are there, your passion, your commitment to your idea is contaminating everything, you know, in a good way. I know it's not in a bad way sometimes. But it's essential to getting this wow, you know, you feel that you, this really makes sense. Otherwise, why do it, you know? But anyway, so, Renzo Sabiano called me up. I said, Mr. Tolles, I must say, the first time in history, somebody has understood my building. And I want, you to let, I want to let you know that the gap between the floor and the ceiling, there's always a gap in this building, is called the reveal gap. I said, are you kidding? My exhibition called RE. So, so this is like, 
It's a beautiful story. When, isn't it? when, uh, yeah. So I got access to air conditioning. I hacked the air conditioning, used the air conditioning in and out of the building, and when I then opened the air conditioning, I repiped the air conditioning to let my work unfold. Heavy molecules on the floor, higher up, 12 meter high up. I bring the exhibition to the University of Pennsylvania. In America, it's all about AC. So I had to have a board meeting at the University of Pennsylvania, ICA, Philadelphia, to change the temperature in the building. 71 Fahrenheit, which is 50 something, and I needed 37 Celsius. It took five weeks. So I did a kind of guerrilla mo movement in the museum, broke into the air condition, I knew how to do it, and I literally hacked the air condition without letting them know. And suddenly I had smell of money running through the air condition, and then it mixed with the smell of vanilla, because the vanilla became the, 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 the new currency during COVID. And it was amazing. So I had piping in and out of the building, uh, you know, through the air condition uh, room. And, I, saw, uh, I saw you yesterday looking at our air condition. And upstairs, yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> so upstairs, my sweat is mixing with the dresses and the images, and you know, this become the kind of holistic understanding of, of a, a future of archiving. Uh, yeah, in this case, fashion. So I think it's one shouldn't forget the invisible and the unspoken. And being in Italy, you get to like about everything. Why don't you just do it more? I don't say anything. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> You make dresses says, for, for, for movement, you yeah. know, like a uh, come the gasol, you know, ooh, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah. Her slogan is, we are who we smell. We are who we smell, yeah. Fantastic. We, we are how we smell. We are who we smell. And that's, uh, yeah, Thank maybe. you, Cecil. Yes. Wow, thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs>